he could step on the stage and this huge person in these great big boots and uh, people would fall about, just laugh at him. It was an indefinable quality. Do you know, when I was a kid, I was ugly. <laughs> I was. His timing was wonderful. He could ride an audience. I was. And he always looked surprised when he got laughs, which was endearing in, in its own way. He went to places that no one else dare go. <laughs> he just was a total original. <laughs> His reputation for drinking was awesome. It was a disguise he could assume at any time in order to be socially comfortable. I felt I never really met him. I met Tommy the performer. I very rarely got any glimpses of Tommy the person. Well, I wouldn't say he was a pushing child. He was rather on the quiet side. Um, but he was always very, very keen on conjuring. Uncle Tom was born in South Wales, Tommy's father, and uh, Auntie Gert was born in Devonshire. Tommy was born in Caerphilly and came to Exeter when he was three. After leaving school, Tommy Cooper had a brief career as an apprentice shipwright before joining the army in 1940. It was whilst he was stationed in Egypt that he began to develop his act, which would barely change throughout his entire career. Egg bag, bag, egg, egg bag, bag, egg bag, egg bag. And now we have one long single piece of rope. In 1946, he met and married Gwendolyn Henty, who he always called Dove. They had two children, Thomas and Vicky. After leaving the army, Tommy Cooper began touring the theater and variety club circuit. In 1947, he began his long television career, even gaining some success with American TV audiences. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Cooper. I was sunbathing this morning, and I was lying in the park, and a little boy crept across to me, and he poured something all over my back. He said, this will make you brown. I said, what is it? He said, gravy. <laughs> Always hugely popular in Britain, by the late 1960s, he was recording his sixth television series. Well, I think he was a sure ratings getter, the because blood. everything he says produces laughter. <laughs> Just before the show, the producer said to me, he said, how are you tonight? I said, well, I'm feeling a little bit funny. He said, well, get out there before it wears off. <laughs> I think Daily Mail or Daily Express, I think they interviewed about 100 people, to find someone who didn't like Tommy Cooper. They couldn't find anyone who didn't like Tommy Cooper. There was a foreman on the building site, a foreman on the building site. He looks at the man at the top of the ladder, he said, you, get your money in your cars, you're finished, wasn't he? He said, get your money in your cars, you're finished, wasn't he? He said, get your money in your cars, you're finished, wasn't he? He said, oh, I sack somebody else. He <laughs> was probably a, one of the highest earning comics around. He was extremely popular, and he always delivered. And after his empty paper bag, I will now produce a live pigeon. <laughs> well, I'd seen him lots of times on stage, but I'd never actually met him until the first day of rehearsals. And as I remember, rightly, I was sitting down, and um, this huge man came in. I hadn't realized till then just how big he was. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And what he always looked when he came out as if he'd been hurled on stage. He always looked uh, surprised and, uh, and panicky. <laughs> he didn't like rehearsing, and he didn't like the idea of it being scripted and down and set in concrete and so on. He liked to be freer than that. <laughs> we learned as we went through the series to make the sketches shorter and shorter. His uh, attention span was not uh, perhaps his strongest suit. Can you serve lobsters? Oh, certainly, sir. Right. What are you have? <laughs> well, the interview was the one each week, which um, was the one I found most difficult to prepare for. <laughs> he liked the idea of the interview sketch. I know there were a man dressed in normal 1960s clothes interviewed somebody in, in, in historical garb. I think he liked that because it was very freewheeling and full of gags.
With Tommy, you never quite knew where the laughs were going to come. Even though they were the ones in the script, but there'd be two or three others, and he would build on them, and he would work the audience on them, you know, respond to the audience and so on. So um, that was always, always a bit of tightrope walking for me. Never once was he relevant to any kind of political situation, any kind of social situation, any kind of any kind of situation. He very seldom referred to the setting he was in, or the set behind him, or the rest of the show. He didn't talk about other performers. He didn't do jokes about famous people. He didn't do anything that was about life. He was. <laughs> It was like a microcosm. Nothing affected the lunatic world in which he lived. Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> I mean, he relied heavily on alcohol, and, uh, but he never drank on the day of the show. And being uh, rather dependent on the bottle, uh, by the time it came to the show, he was starting to dry out. And uh, it was, it, he would be sweating very much and very, very hyper, you know, which is another reason for the size of performance on television. He, went out, he shot himself. Really? Yeah, right in the matter, Chum. <laughs> what's the matter, Chum? Nothing, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Although he was best known as a television star, Tommy Cooper was as much in demand as a live performer as he was a TV personality. He spent much of his life on the road, sometimes turning down lucrative television deals to perform in variety clubs and theatres. Tommy would sell you out. Uh, we would be sold out uh, a couple of weeks before he came. We'd ring Miff, which was his uh, manager, and he'd say, do you want my Tommy? i say, of course I want you, Tommy. That's what I'm ringing you for. I want seven days. No, he won't do seven days, Bob. You can have him for six. You can have my boy for six. And he's going to cost you, same as everybody else, £6,000. And you've got to pay him when he finishes. Do you understand that? Yeah, that's all right, Miff. Do you want the money up front? No, it'll be all right. Pay him on the night. He had a, a lady with him, which was his dresser. Very nice lady. She always came with him. I don't know that Tommy, not being the greatest housekeeper in the world, could have managed to shift all his gear around if it hadn't been for Mary Fieldhouse. I first met Tommy when um, I was working for Thames Television. And uh, after a few weeks, it sort of became obvious, I think, that we were both slightly smitten with each other. And we started a relationship pretty well immediately. We certainly were together for about 17 years. He told me that he was going to travel, and he said, would you like to travel with me? I did quite a lot of paintings of Tommy whilst we were on tour in the various hotels. They were just memories, just sort of whatever happened whilst we were in particular places. We'd be taken to the hotel. I unpacked and got everything ready for him. He had so many medicines. I mean, for his nose and his eyes and, uh, and of course, a lot of cough things. I think he was a bit of a hypochondriac, I really do. And he was a pretty superstitious person. You couldn't put the fez down with the head on the tabletop, it had to be open because the spirits were allowed to be free to roam. What you had to do is you had to look after him while he was here. Well, I used to look after him and give him a free bar. The dressing room was like his home for the week. I mean, he's got a hotel and here. He would go on at 11 o'clock. Yeah, 11 o'clock, and he would do one hour. <laughs> Here's a trick now with three pieces of rope. Watch very, very closely. Look, you go, un, a, deux, trois. That's a bit of French there, you see. Like that. Well, you just bend this over here like this. Now, the, the idea of the trick is this. You just get one of the loops, one, three pieces there like that. See? One of them there, look, like that, see? <laughs> and what you do then, see? <laughs> You put this into, into a loop, like, like that. 
a loop there, then you get that one, you put that into a loop there like that, like that. Then you get the third one, and you put... <laughs> now, I made a mistake, look, you get a long piece of rope. That's... Aha, yes! They more or less knew what he was going to do, but and the fact is, if he didn't do as expected, they would have been disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing changed. He added jokes when he thought they were funny and subtracted jokes when he was tired of them. That's it. If you watched him every night, you'd still fall about because everything he'd done was funny and it was slightly different. He'd never done it exactly the same each night. Hello? <laughs> Here's a little trick that I watch very closely. Look, the red handkerchief there like that, and you go like that. Although yeah. on stage he didn't do many tricks that went well, backstage he would demonstrate that he was a real, true magician, or conjurer, because everything he did was superb. Whilst you've just seen him on the stage doing rubbish in the dressing room, he had sleight of hand, I mean, big hands. Sleight of hands was amazing. <laughs> When he came off, for five minutes it was quiet. It was something that he demanded. If um, Dove was coming down, his dresser wouldn't be here, but all his stuff would be laid out. Dove would always come dressed like Barbara Cartland for the show. I mean, she was... Uh, and Dove used to make as big an entrance as Tommy. That was a moment to remember. You know, Dove's arrived, you could hear a hush go down. She was uh, hard. She was hard. She, she, she'd swear at me. She'd say, you're looking after my Tommy. Uh, you know, uh, this is the best act and he's clean. Uh, you won't find anybody like my Tommy. And uh, she'd be roaring off at me. And Tommy said to her, now, be careful, Dove. Don't go on at him. He's the boss. I remember when he brought Tom in, his son, in, in t t as a sort of a road manager. He used to manage Tommy in case bags and things. He always wanted to know where he was if he wasn't in the room. So if Thomas was down at the bar, uh, Thomas about, um, tell him I want him. Even if he didn't really want him, he needed him close. I don't think Tom felt he got the recognition he needed from his father. I don't... I think it would have helped him a lot if his father had let him know how wonderful that was, that he toured with him, that he was there for him, and that he didn't really concentrate on his own career um, he put that off and put that off because his father needed him. Has it been difficult being the son of, son, son of Tommy Cooper because you're an actor, a serious actor? Yeah, yes, it has. Um, yes, I mean, that's, originally that's why I changed my name. Mm. And when I first started ten years ago, uh, I wouldn't let anybody know who I was at yes. all, nobody. But they always found... I think that was a, a two-edged sword working for his father when really he should have been working in his own right. Um, I wish he'd started sooner and I wish that tragically he hadn't... Um, died and we're still doing it because I do think that he would have been, uh, he would have made his own mark. I used to prepare myself for Tommy Cooper to arrive, knowing it, try and get uh, some early nights in before he comes, try and get some, because uh, I, I go to bed at three every night, up at three, uh, try and get a couple of uh, 11 o'clockers or something in uh, before Tommy comes, because I know directly Tommy comes, there's no sleep. He wanted to be anywhere where he was enjoying himself. And uh, if he could put his hand out and drink what he wanted, uh, and he could, he could give you a drink when you came in, whatever you wanted, uh, he, he, that was his pleasure, it was a social part of his life. And if you said, I'll have a, a vodka and tonic, he would give you a vodka and tonic, and he would pour himself a vodka and tonic. And he would drink the vodka and tonic, cheers, and he'd drink that. And if somebody else comes and have a scotch and lemonade, he would have a scotch and lemonade. You know, I come and say, oh, Tommy, I'll just have a half a Guinness. He'd have half a Guinness. Incredible bloke. <laughs> Throughout his career, Tommy Cooper's popularity never waned. He remained one of the nation's favourite comedians. And my wife, she went to have her face lifted, and they said it couldn't be done. So for £10, they lowered her body. <laughs> I said to the Chinese waiter behind the counter, I said, excuse me, have you got frog's legs? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, well, hop over the counter and get me a cheese sandwich. 
I think drinking was quite a bit of a problem. He did try and give up, you see, but not altogether. It's impossible. We never really discussed why. Why is he drinking? Perhaps it was a bit of insecurity. Perhaps he just needed, again, that, that confidence building. But I, we never really talked about that. He didn't like people laughing at him all the time. I mean, I remember um, we played at a golf club and he said to the steward, I have a gin and tonic. I, I can't do impressions, but it was something like that. And the fellow went, ha, 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 yes, Mr. Good. He went, what are you laughing at? I'm sure there were moments when, when Tom felt a little inadequate. He, he hadn't many social graces, and I don't think he was educated to a degree uh, that he would like to have been. Nor do I think he was all that curious. Uh, otherwise, he would have carried books and become self-educated. So I think, to a certain extent, he must have felt um, so somewhat uncertain. He was insecure about, you know, his largeness. But at the same time, it, it, it was a funny... I mean, he looked funny and people enjoyed laughing at him, didn't they? You know, they enjoyed that sort of strange heaviness and so on. Give me the moonlight. Give me the girl. And leave the rest to me. <laughs> hey! A good deal of the public knew that Tommy was abusing himself with alcohol and with uh, tobacco. I think we all knew that. He was wheezing on stage. Um, and also Tommy, who was the most good-hearted of men, who would do anything for you if he liked you, was starting to lose his temper a lot. And when he lost his temper, he was a big man, he was still strong, and if he picked you up, and he picked people up, and slammed you against the wall, you, you didn't forget it. I mean, <laughs> it would shake you for days. Ah, oh, what a lovely day it's been. Do you know, it's about 80 degrees in the shade. <laughs> I was clever, I stayed in the sun. <laughs> it was the night of his 50th birthday, and uh, he was suddenly realising that, right, you know, he, he was getting older. And he cried. He suddenly said, I, I don't want to grow old. But, um, which seemed, you know, so kind of strange for a big fella to sort of worry about getting old. He was wonderfully buoyant. You know, nothing, nothing got him down, really. I think that Tommy was living and enjoying himself for today. I think he knew there was something wrong there and he was uh, in problems, but he was living every minute. And, and where he died is where he would have wanted to die. And the night he died in 1984, in April, at Her Majesty's, he was very frail. He wasn't as robust as I've seen him. It's strange how you cannot imagine what's going to happen. You just... everything was perfectly normal. The rehearsal went extremely well. Then Tommy, he decided he'd have a sleep for about half an hour. And after the sleep, I took him in some apple crumble, which he didn't eat. And then we went down, and the show started, and it went very smoothly, and Jimmy was delighted. I thank you. The final thing that Tommy was supposed to do was um, this cloak. What was supposed to happen with the cloak? Things were bought from it, and he threw them on the stage. I was waiting behind the curtain to do the last trick with him. And I've heard people say, and people write, they knew he died. No, they didn't, because he didn't fall over. He sank, the girl put the cloak round him, and I was going to come from between his legs, passing him all the things that he was, the, the cod magic he was doing. And he just went there, and then he went, ah, oh, and he settled down on his haunches. He didn't fall. And then they brought the curtain down, and young Tom went on stage. He came towards me and said, this, this, is, this is for real. I, should, I can hear him now saying, this is for real. And then I went on the stage and the doctor was there and, and I, the, the curtain had caught his foot and I moved the curtain so that his foot was clear. And again, that's something that I can remember. Nothing, is it? 
it was a live television show and um, they administered the kiss of life. And he was there while the next two acts were performing. Then a commercial break came in. Whilst we were in the ambulance, the doctors were pounding him. And one of them said to me, he's really fighting. Isn't it strange to say he's fighting when he was sort of lying there? So obviously he didn't, he didn't want to die. The show finished and he'd gone to the hospital and I had to go on the 10 o'clock news. Fellow comedians have been paying tribute to the late Tommy Cooper, who died last night after appearing on stage at a London theatre. The show was being broadcast... Thank you. Thank you. He took the idea of The Conjurer and made it into this extraordinary person who got it wrong, got it wrong, got it wrong, but what Tommy did, which was much more than that, he extended it into being a, a virtually an all-round comedian. I think people have no one to compare him with, and uh, he's just, uh, he was just mysteriously funny. <laughs> On the numerous occasions I worked with him, I can't think of an evening when he didn't steal the show. He was always the, they call it the who's best. Well, he was always, be it a royal show, be it a Sunday night at the Palladium, be it whatever, he was always the governor. I know it sounds crazy, but I can't hear Tommy's voice talking at all. You know how you can conjure up people's voices if you want to, your father or your brother or whatever. You can conjure them up almost immediately. But I can, I can see him and hear him on a television show, but I can't hear his voice. Hello, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He's going now. Three and okay, eight. right. Keep your thumb on it. Oh my God! I like to show a little trick now. Look, there's nothing. First of all, there's nothing in my hand, you see, and also, even my elbows are empty. <laughs> <laughs>